Fighting in Ethiopia escalates again. While Tigrayan forces accuse Eritrea of launching a full-on offensive, the United Nations says civilians should brace for more atrocities. In a moment, we'll hear from the Ethiopian military's former chief of staff and current ambassador to Ankara. I'm Andrea Sankey, and today's newsmaker is Ethiopia. Well, the end of a fragile truce has led to a dangerous increase in violence in Ethiopia's Tigray province. While the region is closed off to journalists, the U.S. envoy there says there is fighting in several areas between government troops and the Tigray People's Liberation Front. To complicate matters even more, the TPLF says Eritrea has sent its military over the border, a move the U.S. says only inflames an already tragic situation. In a report released earlier this week, the United Nations said war crimes have likely been committed and also indicated that some are ongoing. In a moment, we'll speak to Ethiopia's ambassador to Turkey, who previously served as the military's chief of staff. But first, this report on the current state of the conflict. The UN faced nearly insurmountable opposition while collecting facts about the fighting in Tigray. The Ethiopian government rejected investigators' access to areas outside of Addis Ababa. Sudan and Djibouti also blocked them from talking to Ethiopian refugees within their borders, and interviewing people in Tigray remotely was hampered by continuous telecommunications blackouts. And yet, investigators this week released their first report for the UN Commission of Human Rights Experts on Ethiopia. Its conclusion? There are reasonable grounds to believe that parties to the conflict have committed war crimes and violations and abuses of human rights. Those crimes include the shelling of civilians and carrying out of extrajudicial killings. They also say Ethiopian troops raped and sexually abused civilians since the conflict began in November of 2020. The commission also suggested that Addis Ababa uses starvation as a weapon by restricting humanitarian aid into the Tigray region. The tactic has left millions of people in dire straits. However, Ethiopian's government has rejected the accusations. The report itself is self-contradictory, self-contradictory and biased, which doesn't uh, 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 pay any attention to the atrocities committed in Afar and Amahara region, but solely, solely uh, uh, focusing on Tigray. Therefore, we have no other option but to reject this report as you have rejected the resolution that established it and the very establishment of this mechanism as well. But the UN report also accuses the Tigray People's Liberation Front of committing similar atrocities. A survivor of the TPLF offensive in Amhara told the commission, Tigrayan fighters came to my house, dragged me outside and beat me in the mud. My husband arrived and they killed him. Their colonel and three guards raped me. The colonel raped me twice. When he was done, I crawled to my crying children. More soldiers came, beat me, and took my grain. On Tuesday, the TPLF said Eritrean forces have joined Ethiopian troops to launch a full-scale offensive in Tigray. If confirmed, it marks an escalation in the conflict since fighting restarted last month. Fighting the UN says, is likely to cause further atrocities. So with all sides accused of atrocities and violence expected to continue even worsen, I'm joined now from Ankara by Adem Mohamed Mahmoud. He is Ethiopia's ambassador to Turkey and was also chief of staff of Ethiopia's armed forces. Thank you so much for being with us. Greatly appreciated. I will first ask you to establish where you stand because you were dismissed as the Armed Forces Chief of Staff on, on October 8th, 2020. That was just a month before Ethiopian National Forces began their offensive in Tigray. It was reported that you had doubts about the offensive. Did you? No. You had no doubts at all. 
So you are confident that your government is, is doing the right thing in Tigray at present? You know, uh, Andrea, thank you for uh, having me. And uh, as far as the case you raised, uh, you know, uh, the first, uh, the first uh, provocation attack uh, has been uh, made by the TPLF, you know, as you know, the Ethiopian Federal, uh, federal uh, Defense Forces were stationed for about 20 years uh, in Tigray. Uh, so uh, the TPLF elite decided and, um, to attack uh, by the preemptive attack. Uh, so this uh, uh, totally uh, was unacceptable and the uh, government has uh, had a legitimate uh, measure to reverse this attack. Okay, so you feel there is justification to intervene militarily, but could more have been done uh, to work with Tigrayan representatives in the national government to at least avoid the massive escalation that ensued? So, as uh, you know, uh, TPLF is, uh, was one of the dominant party in PRDF. Uh, so, due to the, uh, the reform agenda, which is demanding by Ethiopian people, as the TPLF, you know, became out of the, the power. And um, so the TPLF decided to reverse and uh, disrupt this change. And then uh, the federal government tried his best to accommodate uh, through a number of uh, uh, discussions and uh, negotiating with the elder peoples to come to peace from the outset. Okay. As it stands now, though, it is generally accepted as fact that Eritrean forces are fighting the TPLF and that they are cooperating directly with the government in, in Addis. Some even say that this was part of the, the government's own cynical plan all along to make peace with Eritrea to ensure its support in any future conflict with Tigray. Is there, is there any truth to that? Not at all. You know, uh, the Ethiopian government, uh, one of uh, the reform agenda is to achieve a sustainable, a sustainable peace in the country. Uh, so the Ethiopian government has to deal with the Ethiopian government to, to, to solve uh, the no peace, no war uh, condition for the, about 20 years. Uh, so I think as a good neighbor, uh, the, um, the new government has to uh, solve this uh, this uh, problem uh, peacefully. This is what our government is uh, doing, and there is no anything um, as a purpose of this uh, peace dealing with the Iran government. Okay, you know, part of the reason that we're talking right now uh, is because it's been very difficult, if not impossible, for journalists really to get into the area to document and better understand what's happening on the ground. And also because more government representatives like yourself aren't speaking to the press. Why not? Why has it been so hard to get around the communications blackout, to get journalists and investigators on the ground, and to get more voices from the government to tell us what is actually happening? You know, Andrea, you should have to know that uh, the government of Ethiopia is... Uh is fully uh, giving adequate information for media. Uh, as far as I know, uh, since, you know, uh, began the, uh, the conflict in 20 November uh, 3, uh, 2022, uh, 2020, sorry, 2020. Uh, as far as I know, uh, our government is uh, very transparent and accountable for uh, media organization, including for his people. Uh, I don't know, um, I don't have any, uh, any evidence for this to justify uh, blocking any, any, uh, any journalist to go to uh, the, this conflict area. Uh, but this time, do, do you uh, honestly have it's, no it's knowledge good to that understand that. It's, it's been widely uh, reported how many correspondents have not been allowed in. No, no, no. No, no, no. You, you know, you have, to, you have to know the circumstances of uh, the situation on the ground. Uh, 
So uh, Ethiopian government doesn't have any effective control at all in this conflict area, especially in Tigray. So uh, the Ethiopian government, I think, uh, doesn't, doesn't give anything, any, uh, any information about the situations right now inside Tigray. So uh, the Tigrayan uh, uh, fighters have to uh, do this and are responsible for this to, to inform uh, uh, for the international communities. Okay, it's, it's what people don't understand is in order to get into Tigray, you basically have to go through Ethiopia, and that's where journalists are being blocked. They can't even get the passage through greater Ethiopia to get to Tigray to be able to report and then find out what is actually going on. Um, let me ask you, though, moving forward, we need to talk about how, if at all, peace... No, as, as, far, as, far, as far as I know... As far, uh, okay, as far as I know, Andrea, sorry... Uh, as far as I know, there is no any any demand from uh, uh, your station or from anywhere asking to go to Addis Ababa or to interview, interview anybody uh, to uh, to give you any information about this. And for future, I can guarantee you this, uh, as there is no, there is no any any obstacle or restriction for this. Okay. Well, we'll look forward to that then and see if more, more journalists can get in to actually see what is happening. But in, in the meantime, we, we're, we wanted to discuss as well with you how peace can be restored, um, if it can, because the sad truth, I will put this to you, is that many think the solution lies in the so-called balkanization of Ethiopia, first by even allowing Tigray to secede. Is that at all being discussed as a possibility in the capital? Or are Ethiopian national forces and the government ready to fight until the very end? You know, the Ethiopian government is doing uh, from the beginning, uh, you know, uh, to get uh, a solution uh, for this conflict through a peaceful uh, resolution. So due to this, uh, the Ethiopian government has taken maj many measures. Uh, anyway, uh, starting from Israel force from Tigray and uh, releasing high-profile uh, TPLF uh, leaders and declaring uh, humanitarian truce and also um, uh, declaring a unilateral uh, ceasefire. Uh, this all thing, what the government uh, objective is, just to uh, solve peacefully the conflict. There is no any military solution for this conflict. We know uh, very much about this. Uh, that's why uh, now the Ethiopian Defense Forces, you know, TPLF is attacked for the second, for the third time in Amhara and Afar region. This is already uh, officially announced. Mm -hmm. on uh, 23, uh, August 23, 2022. And then the attack after one day already uh, happened. So this... this uh, okay. Uh, but the, the Amara groups... Uh, TPLF already uh, declared officially... Yes, the, the Amara groups also accused... Yeah, let me finish. Uh, the, the TPLF... Who, sorry? I was going to say that the Amara groups, there are several that also accuse the government of, of oppression, uh, but as you say, they are also fighting the TPLF over land. Oromo groups are asking for self-determination and they accuse the government of, of gross human rights violations as well. Let me ask you, what national sense of unity can the government actually rally when so many ethnic groups disagree with what the government is, is doing, and they do not want a, a centralized state. You know, the, uh, Andrea, you have to uh, uh, understand that this uh, government, current government, is a very legitimate uh, elected by Ethiopian people. So um, I don't think that uh, your, uh, your, your question is relating to the uh, TPLF agenda. The TPLF agenda is just to want to come to power, uh, but that uh, elite uh, had been for about uh, 13 years on power. So um, there could be any, 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 any political um, resentment in some group in somewhere. 
So it doesn't mean this relating this with TPLF. This is really uh, unacceptable and untrue. Right, that, but that's the basis for the conflict specifically with the TPLF, is that the government believes they want to come back to power, they want to control the resources yeah. and more of the economy as they did once before. But I was also bringing up the fact that there are other, several other ethnic groups yes. that disagree with the government. And it seems that the country, in some ways people argue, and that's why we've heard the term balkanization, uh, with so many groups and ethnic groups looking for self-determination, I was asking how the government can go about really rallying support nationwide for the government in Addis Ababa, or is it going to have to keep fighting various groups across different parts of the country? Uh, you know, uh, I again want to explain uh, my government is uh, a legitimate elected government uh, by the 80% of the population of Ethiopia. So uh, there could be any group who uh, dislikes this government or any uh, concern uh, or any uh, agenda, uh, but uh, it's really, uh, um, uh, it's not acceptable to say, uh, to relate these kind of things uh, 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 in our side. But uh, uh, still, my government is ready uh, for inclusive dialogue uh, for any Ethiopians, whatever um, uh, organized and organized at society level, whatever, if there is any consent, any, any uh, consideration for the country who want to see, I think my government already ratified a law uh, to uh, and elected uh, organized committees to facilitate this national-based uh, comprehensive inclusive dialogue. Okay. This is uh, the main and basic uh, uh, platform that the government already committed and doing this one. Okay. Uh, again, on this, uh, on this, on this, uh, in addition to this, you know, the uh, Ethiopian government also is ready to negotiate with the, with the TPLF. This already many times stated and declared but the TPLF, netting reciprocate, the government uh, peace call. Okay, Ambassador Adam, very unfortunately, we're going to have to leave it there. I'd like to thank you so much for joining us on the Newsmakers. Now to the UK, where recently declassified documents revealed that London employed a secret spy unit called the Information Research Department to discredit America's black power movement of the 1960s. And it did so in part with a smear campaign against civil rights leader Stokely Carmichael. Carmichael was a young, charismatic speaker who often faced harassment from U.S. officials. In 1969, he sought refuge in Guinea, where he advocated for socialism and pan-Africanism. Now, this worried the Crown. And in response, the Brits set up a fake black power organization. It produced pamphlets portraying Carmichael as an outsider who had deserted his own people back in the United States. So six decades later, what have been the consequences of the Information Research Department and to what extent and what end do similar efforts exist today? And joining me now to discuss that are from Amherst, Massachusetts. Stefan Bradley, he is a professor of black studies and history at Amherst College and the author of Upending the Ivory Tower, Civil Rights, Black Power and the Ivy League. And from Liverpool is Rizwan Sabir. He is an assistant professor in criminology at uh, Liverpool John Moores University and the author of The Suspect, Counterterrorism, Islam and the Security State. Thanks both so much for being with me. It's you know remarkable how this case actually resonates today with the cause of, of black equality and empowerment being still very much alive, in part you know, because previous movements were not allowed to succeed. So how damaging was the information research department you know, for the cause of the black rights struggle. Stefan, go ahead. Yeah, well, what we're talking about is something that's uh, part and parcel of a, a, a longer history of attempting to neutralize uh, black freedom movement. So you could go back as far as, as Marcus Garvey and the efforts of, of the information uh, bureaus in the United States, uh, as well as those in France and, and uh, Great Britain, 
looking to to uh, disarm the movement in many ways. And so the idea was to neutralize what they thought of as as a potential black messiah. Mm -hmm. So the the problem with this is the different disinformation campaigns that occurred through the 1950s and 60s. So I was talking about this longer history. Malcolm X was surveilled in many ways uh, by similar groups, both here in the United States and abroad. Uh, and so the issue is when when the the, the disinformation uh, is dispersed to 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 various elements of the movement, it causes confusion uh, and allows for disruption. Right. Um, but do you of think the groups at, at the time, Stefan? I mean, if the communist threat, if the Cold War hadn't existed. Mm -hmm. Would these same departments have been created? Mm, I do. I do think so because uh, part of what was happening is is uh, is a major push to t to 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 confront institutional racism, which was the foundation of 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 much of the United States. And so there was a Cold War effort, but uh, that effort uh, used, I think, the Black Freedom Movement as a football in a lot of ways. And so. Uh, for you know, for those on uh, you know on the Soviet Union's side, uh, it was an attempt to show that there wasn't a, a modicum of freedom in the United States. Uh, for those in the United States, uh, okay. you know, those who who came against the United States were considered you know communist and and uh, or communist inspired. Right, Rizwan, tell us a little bit more about why you think the UK specifically wanted to hurt you know, black power movements, what did it fear? Well, I think the first thing we have to remember is that this struggle against um, the black power movement, and in particular Stokely Carmichael, takes place in the scheme of empire. Mm. So the British Information, Re Information Research Department are very, very anxious and concerned that the message that Stokely Carmichael is spreading in Africa may quickly seep over into the British colonies in the Caribbean and may well incite uh, other individuals to align ideologically with him. And therefore, they take a lead role in spreading this black propaganda in order to diminish his influence. Mm. We've got to remember the Information Research Department emerges during the Cold War as a distinct anti-communist entity. And it's with the black civil rights movement and their affiliation to socialism that they also find themselves incorporated into this broader policy framework. Okay. But compared to what the United States are doing in the Cold War, the UK's role is very minimal. Mm. But also uh, the Stokely Carmichael case study is indeed just that. It's one case study okay. that's not necessarily reserved for history, but it's happening today as well. I want to ask you exactly, I mean, what would you compare this to today? Because we're, we're constantly hearing about, you know, foreign meddling in, in other countries, social dynamics and even their elections and not necessarily against individuals, but even ideas. I mean, look at Brexit, for example. What would you cite today as, you know, the same pattern? I think there is most certainly a continuation and there are a series of case studies that have taken uh, place or that have been shown to exist that reveal how black propaganda, where the source is concealed uh, and the information that is being placed into the public space is being done to manipulate a particular audience. So, for example, in a modern context, we can see this example in Iraq that is uh, broken by the Bureau of in Investigative Journalism and the Sunday Times, the London Times, who essentially reveal how a a uh, PR firm contracted by the Department of Defense essentially uh, leaked CDs uh, containing fake insurgent propaganda videos that would essentially be watched by members of the Iraqi community as a way to surveil and influence them. So we can see that in the context of the Iraq war, which is, of course, a very modern phenomenon. Also, interestingly, the Information Research Department, the IRD, only existed for a very short span in the grand scheme of history. It was about 30 years that it existed for. However, what we find in the UK today is the establishment of a successor organization called the Research Information Communication Unit, the RICU, which is based in the UK's Interior Ministry, the Home Office. 
And this organization, interestingly, is headed by Richard Chalk, who was actually part and parcel of the Bell Pottinger uh, organization, the PR firm that was running these black propaganda, uh, propaganda activities mm. in Iraq with the insurgent videos. And of course, the RIKU has been involved in a whole host of uh, black propagandistic campaigns here in the UK uh, in a way where they deceive communities by concealing the government's involvement in these particular uh, PR and propaganda campaigns. So okay. we can see a clear uh, continuation of these historic policies in the contemporary day and age. Watching history repeat itself in many ways. Okay, Rizwan, that will have to be the final word because so unfortunately we're out of time for this segment of the, news, the Newsmakers. I'd like to thank both of my panelists so much, really, for being with us uh, and our viewers, of course, for tuning in as well. Remember, you can follow us on Twitter and do be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. I'm Andrea Sankey. We'll see you next time.